Dr. Andy Brown. I'd like to welcome you all um, to our new social justice model. And um, we're going to actually start off, this is experiential. Um, I know we're getting to the, like the last day of the conference and um, you're thinking if I have to sit through like, you know, too many more of these things, then I'm going to like have a meltdown. The good thing about today is we're going to actually have some interactive activities. We're going to teach the model and then have you actually go through the model yourself. Um, we want it that simplistic. We're not going to do a whole lot of formal introductions this morning. We're just going to jump right into it. So Stephanie and Jordan, you will be a pair. Holly and Thelma will be a pair. You know? Madeline. Madeline and Susie will be a pair. And so we're going to provide you with a situation. And what we're going to have happen is we want you to discuss. I want you to take note of where people might be in the room um, as you make your decision. And so here's the situation. You ready? You all are in a ship, separate ships of course, because I've put you in pairs and triads, but you're, you're in a ship, you're in a boat, and you happen upon a shipwreck. And you only have the ability, no matter how hard you try, and as counselors, we want to try really hard, but you only have the ability to save one person in the ship. There are no life preservers, you can't call for help and you can't fix the boat. You can only save one person. You're gonna have about a minute in your groups that I created to make a unanimous decision about who you're gonna save. And who you see is a mom, someone with information not available, a dude, and a kid. And so I want you to go ahead and get started discussing with your group member who it is that you're going to, to save. Tasha. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the child has sounded time is up. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do, again, recognize the order in which you see us recognize the order in which the people are on the ship and have your unanimous decision for your your group. I'd like for you all to turn to the group behind you and I'd like for you all to go with that group and make a unanimous decision based on who you would say. You have about a minute. Okay. <laughs> 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 you want me to sit right. next to uh, oh, Madeline right there? So who did you all come up with? The kid. The kid. So would you like to know whether or not that's the right answer? Is there a right answer? How about we table that until the end of the session and we will we will talk more about that. Thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Jennifer Tuff. I'm the master's candidate at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, and these are my lovely instructors there. So in recognition of the fact that as counselors we're faced with ethical dilemmas almost daily, right? Um, the ACA developed the Practitioner's Guide to Ethical Decision Making. And I hope that we're all pretty familiar with this, but if you're not, or if you need a refresher, here is their seven step process. Identify the problem, apply the code of ethics, determine the nature and dimensions of the dilemma, generate potential courses of action, consider the consequences, determine a course of action, evaluate the course of action, and implement the course of action. And it's very thorough, very systematic, right? It's supposed to be. But the problem is that it's not supposed to be applied in a crisis situation. Um, arguably, it would be unethical, right, to rush through these steps. Um, and conversely, to try to um, use this in a situation where it's not appropriate. So maybe we can look outside our discipline and see if there is a more uh, appropriate course of action for ethical decision making. So AlphaTrack is a company and they work to develop 
um, ethical decision-making models for crisis situations. So they have a six-step one, so I'm gonna read that. First step, characterize. Size up the situation using available information. Two, recognize. Search a knowledge base for the first event that matches the current conditions. Three, analyze. Compare the past event to the current situation at hand. Four, customize, adapt and modify it. Five, dramatize, so play it out. And six, utilize, put the decision into play. So that seems great, right? That is developed for firefighters, first responders, crisis situations, which is what we need. The problem though is that it doesn't really consider social justice and fairness. Um, and it's not really applicable to our discipline. It's not made for counselors. So there is one called the justice model that's focused chiefly on social justice. And in the justice model, it's an acronym. Each letter stands for one step. The J is justice. Apply the same rules evenly to everyone. U is for utilitarian. Consider what it provides. Does the good outweigh the bad or vice versa? S is spiritual values, such as the golden rule, do unto others as we would have done to ourselves. T is the TV rule. I really like this one. So this is pick a decision based on knowing that you would have to explain your decision on television to the world. The I is influence. Consider how big of an influence this would have, if any. And the C is core values. So consider your core values and whether your decision reflects that. And finally, E, emergency. So is this an emergency situation? So I don't know about you, but if you ask me, maybe that last one should be considered first. If it's an emergency, you want to act. So again, there's a problem in that the justice model is not time sensitive. So there is a critical need for a decision-making model that's relevant for our discipline that's time sensitive and appropriate in crisis situations and based on social justice principles. As you can see, the models that are out there, and there are a few models, they're, they're good, they're intact, but they're also kind of long. Um, how many of you all, I'm just kind of curious, as you were making your decision, went through any kind of ethical decision making model? <laughs> and it was more like, let's do the kid. <laughs> who's, going to, who's going to not save the kid, right? So um, the issue is not just with counselors, but with anyone, including first responders, military, people that come on the scene of an accident or, or what have you. Um, we're not all trained to make those kinds of decisions and choices, um, and our biases have become involved with this. Um, as we're looking at decision-making models and what have you, we went back to 1840, which is where the Birkenhead model was developed. Uh, and that's women and children first. And um, that played out in uh, a uh, maritime incident in 1852, and it was popularized and brought into really, uh, there was a lot of breath breathed into it um, through the Titanic incident. People were trapped in other compartments. Uh, there was not a lot of diversity on the ship um, however, there was a lot of, there were different layers of socioeconomic culture. So they were, um, the people who were kind of the upper crust and the females um, and the children of the upper crust, so to speak, were actually taken out first and of course put in um, lifeboats that were not filled. Um, if men or uh, older, you know, boys or what have you would jump overboard in order to get in, they would actually be shot. And of course, the lower socioeconomic was actually kind of, some of them were chained in um, departments uh, lower in the ship and, and, and whatnot. So we felt like, um, since this came out in 1840, it could use a refresher. But we also wanted to keep it really simple because how many people go through, you know, you're going into a crisis situation, you're like, okay, what's step number seven? <laughs> what's, I can't remember, you know, she said something about TV. I don't remember. <laughs> You know, and really good model, I'm not making fun of it, but in all sincerity, if you've ever been in a crisis situation, um, of course, what we know about the brain is it becomes very focused. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to develop a model that would encompass social justice, um, but also be incredibly simplistic. Okay. So the next 
So the model that we developed is called the AIR model. And just as Andy said, we really wanted to take the time to make sure that it was quick and simple and it applied um, the theory of social justice. And so AIR stands for assessment, so you'll have time to assess the situation. Interventions, what interventions are available, and then review and reflect. So after the crisis or the situation is over, you have the time to review and reflect on what happened. stages as we use this model. So the first thing we look at is crisis. Um, you know, we know that crisis is a situation that occurs, it can be a sequence of events that really impact all future events and um, really be a turning point. We also know crisis is a condition where there's an instability or there's a danger. And this can be social, economic, political, um, international affairs leading to a decisive change. So again, crisis is something that happens and it leads to a decisive change. And then it can be a dramatic, emotional, or circumstantial upheaving in a person's life, okay? Next, we look at social justice. And we are all familiar with the concept of social justice. And we know social justice is about equity and it's about justice for everyone. And so as you're thinking about that AIR model, we want you to think about the concept of social justice and how that can be applied when you're using the model. And then why is AIR important? AIR is a model in which counselors um, can identify the intersection of identities with the dynamics of power, privilege, and oppression that influences the counseling relationship. You're gonna notice that these principles are based on sensation and perception. What do I see? What do I hear? What do I smell? What do I know? And the what do I know is based on discipline training experience as a counselor. There's where that, that counselor training comes into that column. But in terms of what did you see in the crisis? What did, what did you see? Um, how were we positioned? Because remember I said how we were positioned is how you would encounter us on, on the ship. So who was first? Do you? I was not first. a situation with a crisis if you see that someone's in need of help then you're also in need of help this is a basic um, life-saving skill taught by American Red Cross and other agencies if you walk into a situation and people are in need of help you should yell for help or if you've got a phone call for help um, before you proceed always make that assessment um, and talking to Susie and um, I know that she loves to be pointed out she said that several times <laughs> and um, She's done some amazing photography, and she was in India in a very remote place um, photographing exotic, very poisonous snakes. So if she's out there and her helper is trying to stir up some of these poisonous snakes and they get bit, she's welcome to yell help all she wants to. She's probably not going to have any, so she's going to be intervening. Um, the simplicity of the model is this. If everything is the same when you walk into a situation, the first human in need is, is the person that you take out. It cuts through pretty much all of our social biases. Um, it also saves time and saves lives. Um, this is a, a model that's used by jumpers and the um, Air Force. Uh, when they enter a vessel or a situation, a scenario, the first human in need that they get to, they take out. We have I everyone because if everything is the same, that's the, your protocol. If you come into a situation and there's someone who's infirmed or there's an infant, um, you would take those out first because you know, they would need help and then they may not be mobile, they might not be able to kind of get out on their own. But again, if everything is the same, first human in need of help. I say in need of help because people have autonomy. People can make their own choices. 
And so if you come up to, the, you know, to Susie, Holly, someone like that, and they're like, hey, um, do you need help? And they're like, no, go to the next person, or I'm, I, I, you know, I, can, I can make it. Then you go to the next person. Um, so we have the royal eye, the, in, the infants, the infirmed, all things are equal. And then, you know, you got to think quickly, but think safely as well. There's a reason why there's a crisis going on. Don't become a part of the crisis. That's a good rule of thumb. As you're walking in, and if people are laying in like a pool of water or whatever, is there electric current going through the water? Is there something, that, is there smoke? Is there, you know, what's, what's caused this? And how do I not become a part of the, the problem, but stay a part of the health? Dr. Foster talked about um, these five questions that you asked yourself and that they're based on sensation and perception. And what we know about sensation and perception is that they work together. Um, sensation is more the raw data that you receive, and the perception is how you take that data and what you do with it. And so you, when you're looking at each of these questions, like what did I see, what did I hear, what did I smell, what did I know, what did I do, you're going to run through those principles as well. And so it's important for you all to kind of, in this process of reflecting, to think about that, um, the sensations that you receive, the data that, that was received, and how you interpreted that data within these five frameworks. the situation as a whole and talk about not only who would you say first and what order you would say them and also really be intentional in your reflective piece because we're going to talk a little bit about the reflection after. So go ahead and get started. Who are you going to say? to make the decision, knowing from a social justice perspective, we're supposed to, first person we see, first person we say, I really want to give some time to process because I know that your initial response was to say who? Yeah. And where is the kid in the line of people to be saved? So I want to know how that feels for you. And, and I'll be honest, as a bias, and we're really, we're really kind of jumping into our biases. And as my bias, you know, I am really comfortable with women and children first, honestly. When we first started going through this, I was like, this, I really struggle with this, you know? Actually, the development of the eye, the, you know, infant and infirm came afterwards because I was like, you know what, who's going to, I will say that, and I'm actually kind of catching myself because we did actually have someone go through and they were like, yeah, throw the kid out. We gotta save this person. I'm like, then we have. There's always one, right? <laughs> but majority would say, you know, save the kid or the infant and whatnot. Specifically, the infant. And so we had to kind of um, adapt our model, which is why we're doing the model again. We love your feedback, but we also want to challenge biases because that's, you know, I keep the point. I mean, social justice is challenging people's biases, mm -hmm. and we, I think we really have to get involved and challenge our own biases first. I think. For me, if I could jump in. Absolutely. One of my, and I'm a Red Cross disaster responder, mm -hmm. is 
but I could choose one to save, my chances of saving a smaller person are probably higher. But if I'm trying to rescue a big guy, if a physical rescue is necessary, I'm probably not going to succeed. Whereas I would have a chance to drag a kid to safety. So I think part of it is just logistical, physical resources. You made a good assessment there, though. You know, you walked in, and, and the kid was the first person that you got to that you could say physically. And that's part of when we talk about like incorporating the senses into the model, um, that was something, you know, uh, not based necessarily on biases, that was based on physical um, capabilities. Yeah. Because that's the other piece, you never want to become part of the crisis. Yeah. Well, with Red Cross, the very first thing they teach us is your safety first. So we can't enter a scene if there's electrical wires and the state is ground, anything that we can't, right. that ours, you know, unless the emergency firefighters, officers have responded first, we're not allowed in. Right, and we haven't even gotten to the point like if after you get us off the deck of the Titanic, what are you gonna do with us, <laughs> right? Is there, is there a boat waiting for us or are we just jumping off into the water, right? right? We're not gonna last very long, it happens. But still, you're trying. But let's talk some about the decision because it was a pretty, easy decision it seems like like oh here we're the kid was it easy no. so wasn't an easy decision to say and we're going to save information not available <laughs> so let's talk about that because it's that stuff that keeps us from acting and whether it's our biases or our stuff or whatever we want to call it it's, it's that kind of Stuff that keeps us from acting. So what came up for you guys in the first round? Was it time? Was it just under pressure of information? I mean, we can see all of you standing there, but if we came on the deck of the deck Titanic, we could, might be able to see some of you are injured or maybe one of you is dead or, you know, that would help us make a better decision faster than just saying, like, okay, we're just, we're just going based on just knowing the ages or I think the bias came up for sure about the dude, you know, like, oh, he'll be fine. He can probably swim or, you know, I definitely felt it. I think some of us kind of shared that sentiment. Oh, he'll be all right. You know, like, let's move on to the next person. Well, we appreciate you sharing, and you're certainly not alone with your biases there. I think we've heard, let's like, say, women and children so much that my mind immediately and, then, and it's going to be a hard track to change, you know, something that's been out since the 1840s, right? And, and when you're really kind of challenging people to say, you know, but if you think about it in modern times, if you have a first responder that goes into a house that's on fire, and that's first responder, um, you know, I pick on like Holly just because I know her and I can, um, but if Holly goes into the house and she pulls out three people from the house that all look like her, that are maybe Caucasian and they're female, when the TV does come, and they, or the court case does come, and they say, how did you make that decision? What is she gonna say? Um, if we don't have that social justice model in place, we're also looking, look at it as we're also protecting first responders, um, because this gives them an adaptation, a model to follow, um, that justifies why they do what they do. Because if you do show up and everyone that you saved looks an awful lot like you, you're, they're, you know, you're, there are gonna be a lot of questions to answer in the modern context. So any other things that came up? Anything you're just like, I hear what you guys are saying, but it's just kind of a hard and jagged pill because it kind of goes against things. I have to tell you, we had some very intense conversations around this. And we brought it to a faculty at a school. And we're like, let's do it with a faculty. And you know, as faculty, people assume that we've arrived, right? <laughs> uh, and we sat in a room for, what, about an hour? And it was, there was no unanimous decision. There was no unanimous decision. And again, it's about all of our experiences and all of our training and all that we know about the world that we bring into the room with us. Um, and then, you know, somebody said, you know, Susan, 
But this is the Titanic and we're counselors. And so really, what is the likelihood that we're going to happen upon a crisis of this magnitude? And I have to tell you, living in South Louisiana, that's a regular occurrence for me. And so to say that a crisis isn't going to happen, you know, a mass shooting that might affect you as a counselor, um, a natural disaster, what are some other things that we can think of? Um, it, you know, the potential is great that the longer you practice, the more possible it is for you to happen upon a crisis. Yeah, and currently I vacillate in between um, Chicago and North Carolina and Florida. In North Carolina and Florida, we tend to be hurricane magnets. And so the, the possibility of coming up, uh, upon a crisis like this is incredibly real. Um, now that we have more natural catastrophes coming up, we have more, it's not just like 9-11 events, it's not just sinking ships, um, but the weather's gotten wacky and um, crazy things out there are happening. So to, for you to walk into a building or a house after it's been hit by a hurricane or a tornado is a lot more probable now than it probably ever has been. My bias, when, when we first started working through this, I would have got, you know, I would have gone to the women and the kid, you know, first, and that's, I had the same tape playing in my head that so many other people do. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to make it simplistic, again, um, and we we agree, and that's part of it. Make sure that you don't want to become a part of the crisis. But if, if everything is the same, first human in need, um, and it's there's not a multi-layered step there. Outside of that, you're engaging your senses into the process, um, as we've talked about, uh, to make kind of um, assessments. As she was saying, like, hey, the first person that I can save would be the kid. That's where I'm at physically. That actually makes sense. And the truth is, the kid may be a better swimmer. Mm -hmm. And you, my husband right. is six foot 270. He would sink like a rock. <laughs> he doesn't know how to swim. He's intimidated by the waters. So I thought we didn't you know, want to be out in that position. Yeah. Um, so it's hard. Yeah. The, 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 the assumption would be like, oh, okay, you could help. Right. And it is like if I'm in going to, um, uh, I've been to several Titanic exhibits. I was speaking up um, in Canada a couple of years ago, and, and they brought all the um, survivors um, and the, uh, the people who had passed from the Titanic there into port in uh, Nova Scotia, that area. And so they have a nice uh, museum and they have a graveyard there and whatnot. They had this little box of water. You stick your hand in, it was the exact temperature of what they would go into. And you could not keep your hand in that water more than a few seconds. It was ice cold. They, kept, they had to keep the water moving so it wouldn't actually freeze, of course. So you would put your hand in there. And I was just like, wow. You know, that really kind of made, made it vivid for me what, what they went through. you know something else that's challenged you go into a situation and maybe you know one of the people that have been involved it's entirely possible for you to know at least one or more of the people that are involved in the crisis situation and in those and in, in that um, scenario it really kind of changes things for us all <laughs> yes that's not just a kid right yeah. Yeah. yes and one thought that came to my mind is I'll, I'll give up my seat on the boat. So that the mom and the kid can go to the boat. And so that's something that I think happens in school shooting. So I think they're allowed to stop this person than other people being. 
You actually bring up a good interesting point because I've, I've had an opportunity to interview different types of first responders and military and whatnot and trying to develop this kind of protocol. And I was like, so you get into this RAF situation, you can only take one other person on, but there's two people. What do you do? Just like watch the other person drown? And actually they said, you, you rotate in and out of the water. And so you can you know keep an extra person or two alive that way. And so I didn't really think about that, but it was interesting. Um, learned a lot through the process and, and super enjoyable. What, yeah. what were some of the ideas about who the Usually, really, who she is most days. <laughs> so that was. Um, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but this one was my idea, um, and, and it's. And I did it on purpose because the other thing, like from a experience place, we go with what we can see right there in the moment. Like I see, dude. You know, my bias would not have been to save him first. Um, my bias was actually to save the child. Um, in the South, where I'm from, um, women and children are seen as a more fragile kind of um, subset of people, and um, and so that's all of my own stuff. And um, what came out in our discussion is, what would you do with someone that you didn't really have all of the information? What would you do? How easy would it be to bypass that person and say? I don't even know what we have going on here. Next kind of thing. Because there's going to be situations like that. Think about 9-11 when the towers fell and maybe all you could see is legs. And you have no idea, is this a woman? Is this a child? Is this a, a man? Is this someone that was already um, you know, incapacitated? Are they black? Are they white? I have no idea. I'm just seeing their legs. What would I do with that? Yeah. And you know, as you were talking, um, Susan, one thing I thought about was the fact of just asking, do you need help, kind of alleviate some of that bias that can sneak in. Because if you make an assumption that because I'm a woman that I might be weaker or frailer or whatever, if I'm ask, if you ask me if I need help and I say no, go help someone else, then that, that kind of takes away some of that, that you hold, you know, that biases that you hold.